soon we'll be, we will start doing children's sermons again. So I just thought I'd put that out there at this time as well. Well, you've probably heard something like this. Oh, Clara, Clara, you make the best apple pie. Just the best apple pie. Oh, Pastor, you preach the best sermons. Oh, your sermons are just so wonderful. Oh, Richard, you are the best car mechanic. I just, Richard, I just don't know anybody like you who can work on a car. You are just the best. And so and so on. You are the best, the best, the best. Now, of course, what you were supposed to do with that was stick your own name in there, right? Sometime in your life when you may have gotten some praise and someone has come up to you and said, Oh, you are just the best. There's just nobody like you. And we like to receive praise, don't we? Doesn't praise feel good? It feels nice. People notice us. They tell us how great we are. At least that's the whole idea of praise. And you know, praise, it can be something valuable. Praise can be a valuable thing. Or, as you probably might guess too, it can be a detrimental thing. It can be something that's not necessarily so good. It's valuable if it hones us. If it, if it strengthens us in a way for service, as you would guess, from the hymns we've been singing today and the hymns we will soon sing uh, and what's in our messages for today. Uh, praise can be great if it hones us. Like, for example, if someone comes up to me and says, Pastor, you did a great sermon. I say, well, thank you. And then I you know, try to think, well, what did I preach this Sunday? And then I, I kind of look at the lessons again and, and, and try to make sure that I'm online. And, of course, there's other... There's other Sundays when pastor come up when people come up and say, Pastor, I really found your sermon interesting today. <laughs> and you know that's the one when you had a clunker, right? You know, that's, that's the one where it... And, and I'll tell you what, when I preach a sermon, oh boy, there's different levels of struggle. I, some of them can be clunkers and some of them can be very easy. What do you do with praise? What do you do with praise? And thank God, thank God for the Holy Spirit, at least in the case of preaching... Uh, when, when someone comes up and says, I really loved it when you said, I don't remember saying that, but boy, I'm sure glad you got that out of it today. That's when the Holy Spirit can help out quite a bit. The idea of praise, indeed. Valuable if it owns us, if it makes us try something new, or maybe reinforces something uncomfortable. And I say if it reinforces something uncomfortable because... You know, sometimes we go about life the same old way, the same old way, no matter what it is that we do. And someone praises us and we say, well, you know, it could be something as simple as, well, I put a new spice in that casserole. Or I put something new or a little slightly different in that apple pie. That's interesting. They seem to like it. You know, that little bit of a growing edge. Or as I said, detrimental. How can praise be detrimental? Well, it can lock us in place, right? We go, yeah, <laughs> I know I'm the best. Yeah, I know. You know, I'll show you don't need to tell me. I know I'm the best. We get ourselves locked into place, right? And sometimes praise can hamper growth if we just say, well, I'll just do more of the same then. If, uh, if they like that, I'll, I'll give them a little bit more of the same. Uh, praise can also be something, too, if... We don't really listen to the praise, per se, but we just kind of let it pat our fragile ego. You know, have you ever known anyone who's gotten grumpy or upset if they don't get praise? They've got to get praise every time, because they need to have that ego petted. They need to be preened every once in a while. And then, you know, what, was, what is that other than just feeding that peevish child that lives inside of us, right? What Martin Luther would call the old sinful self. That human being that tries to break into our life every day and take over. That old sinful human self that wants to be what? Or thinks it is what? Number one. Boy, this world just couldn't get by without me today. It sure is a blessing that I'm here because I'll straighten everything up. <laughs> As humans, we, we come hardwired, don't we? 
We're told that in Scripture. We're hardwired, wanting our own way. Think about what is the very first sin. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, what does the serpent or Satan say to Eve? Well, God told you that if you eat that fruit, you will die. Why, he knows you will surely will not die. Instead, your eyes will be opened and you will be like him. And boy, there it is, isn't it? I mean, isn't that really, if you think about it, the bedrock of all sin? What is it other than that we just want to be God? We want to be the one that calls the shots. We want to be the one that's right all the time. We want to be the one that's the go-to guy or the go-to gal. And we're hardwired. That's part of that original sin idea. Human nature is a selfish nature. Martin Luther would say to us, pulling that from Paul, pulling that from Scripture. Isn't it interesting that most times... What, what does a baby learn first? The word no or the word yes? Usually it's no. No. And you see that creep up in that little critter's personality before they even know what else to say or what else to think. We might know people or maybe at some point in our lives we have cried and thrown a tantrum because we're thinking only of ourselves. Selfishness. And that's where all of this comes from today. Let's go to our first reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And what do we read there in verse 6? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And we're comfortable with that. We like things our own way. We like to make things our own way and say things our own way and believe things our own way. We feel comfortable. And maybe one of the reasons why we draw comfort from things like that as human beings is maybe is at the very core of our being we really know we don't know a whole lot. And maybe we're not in control of as many things in our lives as we would like to be. And so there's that sign of insecurity, right? What do you do when you feel like you're out of control? Well, you try to grab more. And if you can convince others or receive that praise, that might just kind of reinforce our own understanding that we're in charge or we know more than everybody else. And what a comforting feeling that can be. We go to our gospel. What does our gospel say? Well, we see probably some of, we probably see two of the most bombastic disciples come forward. Boy, this fits James and John. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they weren't known as the sons of thunder for no reason. Here come the two of the most bombastic, loud, big mouth disciples in Scripture. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Whatever we ask of you? Really? Really? And so Jesus says, well, what is it that you want me to do for you? And of course, what do they do? Well, they lift themselves up, right? Or they want Christ to lift them up. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. In other words, what are they saying? We want to be as high as you are, Jesus. In other words, what are they saying? We want to be God. And we see that original sin, don't we? Poking its head in again. Maybe not in so many words, but that's exactly what that means. What else would it mean to sit at the right and the left hand of God in His glory? One almost wonders if Jesus would have said, Okay, guys, that sounds like a great idea. If they would have then argued who sat on the right and who sat on the left. Probably. That's probably where it would have went next. And so we see that in our gospel lesson today. We want you to grant us. And isn't that interesting? Whatever it is that we want, whatever we ask of you. Now, before we get too comfortable and think, well, these buffoons, these idiots, these buffoons, how many times do we go to the Lord in prayer, I wonder? And we have the same attitude and we have the same thinking. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and when we go to the Lord in prayer, we're going to ask Him for a whole bunch of stuff, and He better do for us whatever we ask of Him. Because if he doesn't do what I want him to do, 
If God doesn't do what I want God to do, well, then I just may not believe in Him anymore. Or I may just get angry with the whole situation and just bow out. And so once again, we might see within our own hearts, within our own minds, in a more subtle way, but yet a way that is there nonetheless, this idea of this childish nature springing up who knows from where because we want to be God. Let's go to our second reading for today. What do we see there in our second reading? Well, what we see in our second reading is Jesus who does it right. Jesus who does it right, yet within that is once again kind of this ongoing warning of, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, just hold your horses. Hebrews chapter 5, we go to the fourth verse, and one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God. Just as Aaron was, just as Christ did, did not glorify himself in becoming this high priest. And so what is Hebrews chapter 5 reminding us or telling us today? Well, all good things come from God. All good things come from God. And yes, even the ability to serve and to serve properly and in a way that matters for the kingdom, that also comes from God. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to do that which is just dreadfully horrible. We have to wait on God's timetable. We want to serve so badly, but yet, maybe not quite yet can we see the way in which to do that. We may want to serve one another, but sometimes service just isn't needed where it is that we want to put ourselves and in the way or in the category that we ourselves desire it's then that we open up our hearts and our minds to God through Jesus Christ. And finally, God says, you know what? Yes, indeed, it is now your time. Now it is your time. Of course, as Christians, how do we know that happens? Well, through service, through service, listening, watching, waiting, praying. But then when that time comes to act, acting in such a quick and important way. It's all about being called forth and going forth, called by God's, by God. God's calling sustains, it lifts, it covers us. You know, you've heard me say it earlier about how many times I've preached a sermon and I've gone, boy, I just think I botched that one today. And then someone has shaken my hand in church on the way out and said, Pastor, I really loved it when you said such and such. And I'm really glad that they heard that because it wasn't anything that really came from my lips. That was between them and the Holy Spirit. So also with other kinds of service. We may think we're impressing ourselves upon other people through certain kinds of service, but they see something different. They see something different and the Holy Spirit touches their life in a way that's very important. You see, there's one who carries our iniquity. There's one who carries our imperfection. There's one who carries all of that and us along with all that stuff, and that is Jesus the Christ. Going back to our first lesson for today, yes, all we like sheep have gone, gone astray. We have all to, turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. The righteous one, we continue there in verse 11. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. My friends, this written 700 years before Jesus Christ was born in the manger. I like what it says. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Where does our righteousness come from? Not from in and of ourselves alone. 
but from a gift of the Holy Spirit when we desire to serve and then Jesus Christ who bears our iniquities and makes us per perfect to do his will. We go back to our gospel today and we look once again at this ludicrous, this ludicrous request from James and John. But then we see also how it turns out, doesn't it? Jesus once again says, you wish it this way. In other words, this is how the Gentiles rule over one another. But this is what I say to you. In verse 43, but it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's a hard lesson today. It's a hard lesson because we want to act. We want to make things happen. We want to be the one that's in there doing it all and getting it all done. And we want people to look at us and praise us and, and understand how important we are to the overall institution. And this is church or work or home life or wherever you may be. But instead, what do we find ourselves called to do? To serve, to serve with love, and to serve one another in a way that is unlike James and John. Not bombastic and loud and demanding, but instead in a way that's loving and true and nurturing. And as scripture says elsewhere, where sometimes the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. When we give that little cup of water to a child, someone who can't even pay us back. That is true service. Called to serve because when we never know when it may be our turn to be served. We put our faith and our trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, thanking the one who carries our iniquities and our sin. That makes us fit for the kingdom and fit for service. So go forth knowing today, new creation, that is who you are today, new creation. Go forth trusting in your master and your Lord, not in that he lords over you, but in that he serves you. And in serving you, then go forth and serve others. Amen.